You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm back with my wife, Mary Jane. Hi. And uh, it's getting very close to Christmas. We just had Thanksgiving, what, about four days ago now as we're, we're recording this? And yeah. uh, we're getting close to Christmas. So um, it got me to thinking about what was the worst Christmas I ever had. And honestly, nothing really came to mind. That's probably because I'm Jewish. And uh, although we did uh, celebrate Christmas every every year with my family, nothing really, really was that bad. Uh, occasionally, uh, and I have to admit, uh, being a Jewish family, we spent many years at Chinese restaurants. Right. It's more lower key for you. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, uh, you know, uh, when I was younger... Uh, probably up until about the age of 20, we went to my Aunt Betty's house and she always cooked and she had the Christmas tree and everything. But uh, unfortunately, she got older and she couldn't do that anymore. So then we started going to a Chinese restaurant because really that's the only thing that's open on Christmas Day. Right. Um, yeah. But really nothing. I mean, occasionally someone have a little bit too much to drink and there might be an argument or something between, you know, some relatives, but nothing really bad. Uh, now, I've known you for a long time. I know you have a re- you have a really right. worse story. So why don't you tell that real quickly? Well, it was about 20 years ago mm-hmm. and I was going through my divorce. Not for me. Not, no, not from you. And um, that was bad, of course, but also I'd gotten quite sick. I'd gotten the flu. And I decided that I really should go to urgent care to find out if I really should even be with my family at Christmas. And I I said to the doctor, you know, my dad is older. He has asthma. My niece is very young. She also has asthma. And I just said, do you, you know, I was also coughing a great deal. So I said, do you really think it's okay if I spend Christmas with my family? And I thought he'd say, yeah you know but he actually said I actually I think you should sit this one out I think you should stay home (laughs) and uh I was very I guess I don't know why I was very surprised and I you know I stay composed I stayed composed and then I walked to my car went to the parking lot and just cried my eyes out because you know when you're going through like a divorce the last thing you want to do is spend your Christmas entirely alone away sure away from your family of course today uh, we have Zoom and things like that. It would make it a lot easier. So, you know, you can be part of... In fact, we just did right. that for Thanksgiving. Your sister... Yes, uh, yeah. We had your brother-in-law over, but, uh, you know, his wife, your sister, Kathy, sure. went out to see your niece, Sierra, in Colorado, and we just did it all via Zoom. Yeah, and, it was great. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, anyway, if you think your Christmas story is bad, I have a really bad story for you. Okay. Uh, this is I'm not going to be... An, <laughs> this is not going to be an uplifting Christmas story, but it, I think it's a good story, and it's one that needs to be told. All right. So I'll just tell you before we get into it that it's a story from the 1920s, and it's about a man who's dealt a really, really bad hand in life. And his only solace was to go take care of some hogs on the chain gang. Uh, And believe it or not, that's all he wanted for Christmas was to go spend time with the hogs. So as I said, it's not going to be one of those uplifting stories, but I think it is a good one. Anyway, this is the Useless Information Podcast. I'm Steve Silverman. And this is Mary Jane, his wife. And today I present to you the true story that I've titled Tom McGee's Back on the Chain Gang. Useless information. I can say with almost certainty you've never, ever heard of Tom McGee, at least not the Tom McGee I'm about to tell you about. You see, for a brief period between 1928 and 1930, his story would appear in newspapers all across the United States. This is a bit surprising since Tom was the type of person that few people would ever take notice of. Tom had no known family, no true friends to speak of, he couldn't find suitable employment, he was illiterate, and his home was, quote, under the stars. In fact, it was his -his down-on-his-luck story that brought him to national attention. And our story begins during the evening of Wednesday, February 8th of 1928. There we find 32-year-old Tom McGee walking into an Atlanta, Georgia police station and calmly telling Captain A.J. Holcomb, quote, I want to go back to the chain gang. I was released from the river camp several weeks ago, and Warden Claude Mills told me that if I ever got out of a job, to come down to the police station and they would send me back to the gang, end quote. You know, considering the horrific reputation that the Georgia chain gang had, to any outsider, Tom's request just seemed insane. 
you know, men were desperate to escape from the chain gang. Nobody was trying to get back to it. In fact, Robert Burns' 1932 book, I'm a Fugitive from a Georgia Chain Gang, which happens to be one of my favorite books of all time, told in detail of his harsh treatment while he was on the chain gang. This book, coupled with the Academy Award-nominated movie that was based on it, they are credited with bringing the cruelty of the chain gangs to national attention, which ultimately led to their complete outlaw in Georgia in 1937. So there Tom McGee stood before Captain Holcomb pleading to be sent back to the chain gang. But the problem was that Tom had committed no crime. And Holcomb explained, quote, Well, we can't send you for absolutely no reason at all, you know. To which Tom replied, But Captain, if you won't send me up for vagrancy, excuse me a minute and I'll go out and steal something. That's how I got in before, and I'm hungry. So Holcomb reached into his pocket and handed Tom some cash and told him to go next door to purchase some food. He figured that would fill Tom's stomach and, you know, of course it would put an end, at least temporarily, to Tom's desire to return to the chain gang. So Tom took the money and he went to get something to eat. Now before we continue, uh, let me first state that all of Tom's previous crimes have been minor offenses. And when I say minor, I mean very minor offenses. His first time on the chain gang was a result of him stealing a sack full of mail. And while he was there at the chain gang, Tom discovered his true calling in life. You see, the guards there kept a litter of pigs along with a few larger hogs, and Tom found immense joy in caring for these animals. Then, after his release, Tom was miserable and he wanted nothing more than to go back and care for the hogs. So his solution was to commit petty crimes, and that would result in him being sent back to the chain gang. Now, the first of these was the theft of a red lantern that belonged to the city. And after his arrest, Tom pleaded with the judge for a one-year sentence on the chain gang, but he was disappointed when he was only assigned a six-month stint. For his next offense, he walked up to an officer on Marietta Street and asked to be sent back to the chain gang. But the officer explained to Tom that he needed to commit a crime first. So Tom took a few steps. He picked up a brick, and I think you know what's going to happen here. He heaved it through a plate glass window. He then stated, quote, Now I reckon you'll send me up for burglary. And once again, Tom did not receive the lengthy sentence that he desired. You see, Tom requested five years, and the judge sent him away for a measly 12 months. Tom stated, quote, You get food and clothes and plenty to do at the river camp, and that's all any man could want, end quote. Now that I've given you a bit of background on Tom, let's return to that February 8th, 1928 evening when Captain Holcomb gave him some money to get a meal. Well, it didn't work. Tom soon returned to the police station, quote, I still want to go, Captain. I had such a good job at the river camp. Warden Mills is the finest man in the world. When I was at the gang, I had lots of work to do, but he always had plenty of clothes and plenty to eat, too. Feeding the hogs and cows was my job. Well, Holcomb clearly felt sorry for Tom, but there was very little that he could do. So Tom just walked out into the darkness. Two days later, Tom approached Officer Hambrick at Atlanta's Five Points intersection and asked him if it was a crime to steal a red lantern. Hambrick gave the obvious answer of sure and then added, if you did that, I'd be obliged to lock you up on a charge of larceny. Well, at that very moment, Tom pulled out from under his coat a red lantern that he had stolen from the Georgia Power Company and stated, quote, okay, call the wagon. While being booked, Tom unsuccessfully tried to convince the recorder to increase his bond from $100 to $300, which is approximately $4,600 today. Tom may not have gotten his bond increased, but he was sentenced to another six-month stint on the chain gang. And this allowed him to be with the only friend that he thought he had in the world. That was Warden Mills, who I believe was just being nice and courteous to him, and to do the one thing that he was truly good at, that was to feed and care for his hogs. By June of that year, Tom was once again a free man. Then, on Wednesday, June 20th of 1928, Tom was hauled into city court and charged with vagrancy. 
He pleaded with Judge Jesse M. Wood to give him a two-year sentence on the chain gang. But, of course, he was disappointed when Judge Wood determined that six months would suffice. This short sentence, at least in Tom's mind, it placed him back on the streets of Atlanta by January of 1929. And he was destitute and he truly, truly, truly missed his hogs. Then, on Saturday, February 16th of 1929, Tom once again wandered into the police station and demanded he be charged with larceny. His crime? Once again, he had stolen a red lantern. Are you seeing a pattern here? (laughs) Tom begged and pleaded with Lieutenant J.A. Scott to arrest him, but Scott declined, claiming he had no time to appear in court. I'm guessing he just saw this as a nuisance. Anyway, while Scott was uninterested in arresting him, he did suggest that Tom go out on the street and find a patrolman who would arrest him. And that's exactly what Tom did. He once again located Officer Hambrick at five points, and he proceeded to arrest Tom. Then, on March 4th, Tom pleaded guilty before Judge Wood and was sentenced to 10 months at the river camp. But, as you can probably guess, Tom was disappointed with this sentence. He told Judge Wood, quote, Trouble is that your sentences ain't long enough. You see, he requested two 10-month sentences and only got one. According to the Atlanta Constitution, this would be Tom's seventh trip to the chain gang, although it is clear that he was being given preferential treatment at the river camp because his crimes had been so petty. He was released on December 1st, but Tom was a lost man. Unable to find employment, he walked into the police station during the morning of Wednesday, December 18th, and asked to be returned to the river camp on a charge of disorderly conduct. But recorder Murphy Holloway couldn't justify sentencing Tom on a charge that he made up against himself, and Tom was released. But Tom wasn't about to give up. He was again back before recorder Holloway that Saturday. This time, he used his old trick to get back on the chain gang. You know, he stole another Red Lantern. He told Holloway, quote, The river camp's the only home I've ever had, and if you won't send me out, I'll violate the law where the county police have charge and go before another judge who will send me there. Tom continued, The only way I can have a happy Christmas is to be at the river camp feeding the hogs. But Holloway wasn't buying it. He found, quote, insufficient reason for imprisonment, although officers were kind enough to let Tom spend Saturday night in a police headquarters cell. Tom wished to stay in that cell until Monday and predicted, quote, At that time, something must happen. I've been away from the camp almost a month now, and the hogs must be getting terribly thin while I'm trying to get back, end quote. Upon Tom's release Sunday morning, he was desperate to find a way back to his hogs. You see, his old trick of stealing a red lantern had clearly failed, so he needed to do something that would result in a definite conviction. Well, after pounding the pavement for several hours, he stopped in front of Berman's men's shop, which was at 14 Decatur Street. He picked up a heavy rock and then he threw it through the window. He proceeded to steal a shirt valued at $1.65, which is about $25 today. Tom's next move was to go down the street to Five Points and question Officer Paul Jones as to what he would do if a man broke a store window and stole a shirt. Jones replied, quote, I'd lock him up. Tom then stated, quote, well, that's what I did, and then he pulled the shirt out from under his coat. Jones immediately arrested Tom, and he was locked up on a burglary charge. Tom was about to learn that he had finally gone too far. He was brought before recorder A.W. Calloway on Monday morning, and Tom explained, quote, I'm not crazy, Judge. I just haven't got any other home, and I want to go back to the river camp where the hogs are waiting to be fed. Harry and Hyman Berman, they were the owners of the Decatur Street Men's Shop, they opted not to testify against Tom at the hearing since they felt that he could, quote, easily obtain his Christmas present, a commitment to the gang, without them, end quote. Harry Berman continued, quote, We do wish, however, he had chosen a larger and more prosperous place to plunder, end quote. 
Now, the brothers didn't have insurance, and the estimated cost to replace the broken window was $75, which is about $1,150 today. Hyman stated, quote, I'm not one to hold a grudge, and I wish Tom well in his attempt to get back to the only home he knows. Harry added, quote, We'll just have to charge it, I guess, to a gift for Tom McGee, end quote. Merry Christmas, Tom. At the end of the hearing, recorder Calloway decided not to send Tom back to the camp. Instead, he referred the case to the Fulton County Grand Jury, who would not hear Tom's case until after the new year. Tom immediately realized he'd be unable to spend Christmas with the Hogs, and he pleaded with Calloway, quote, Those fellows out there, Aaron Thompson, Warden, and Tony Gilbert and J.W. Dollar, the guards, need me, and I'm going to get there as soon as possible. Well, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors, and when we return, we'll find out if Tom got to spend Christmas with his hogs, and then what happened after that. Welcome back. Just before the break, Tom McGee learned that he may not be able to see his hogs for Christmas. Or would he? So let's continue on with the story. Tom, who believed he didn't have a single friend in the outside world, suddenly found out that he really did have some. A group of people familiar with Tom's love for his hogs learned that he'd be spending Christmas Day in jail, and they made a last-minute Christmas Eve appeal to Fulton County Superior Court Judge John D. Humphreys, and they requested that Tom be permitted to spend Christmas up at the river camp. Humphreys agreed to do so, and Tom placed his signature, just a simple X, onto the documentation. Yet it was too late to send Tom up to the river camp that day. Darkness had begun to set in, and the steep, slippery roads proved far too dangerous to travel on. So early the next morning, a deputy sheriff drove Tom up to the river camp, and that gave him plenty of time to feed the hogs their Christmas breakfast. At the end of a great day, Tom was returned back to Fulton Tower, which was the nickname for the Fulton County Jail at that time, and he awaited the outcome of his case. On Wednesday, January 8th of 1930, Tom stood before Superior Court Judge Verlin B. Moore and pleaded guilty to the charge of burglary. Judge Moore made it clear that he would not be going easy on Tom. You see, Moore felt that Tom was making a mockery of the prison system and that no one, absolutely no one, should desire to be a part of it. He wanted to make sure that Tom finally got a bad taste for prison life. So Moore handed down a sentence of two to three years, although it was up to the prison commission to determine where he would serve his time. It could be at the river camp or it could be somewhere else. They ultimately decided to send Tom to a different prison camp. And that meant that Tom would never, ever get to see his beloved hogs again. Now, I do need to mention that I've known this story for a number of years. I'm not even sure how long at this point. But I always felt that my research was incomplete. And on my folder, I had a sticky note attached to it that said, no definite ending, which basically meant I couldn't tell the story. But once or twice a year, I'd pick up the folder and start searching the various databases for more information, but I never found out how the story ended. Well, it all changed a few weeks ago. I stumbled across Tom's name in the Georgia Central Register of Convicts on Ancestry.com, and I am not kidding when I say it offered the worst of worst Endings. Here we go. According to the one line entry in the volume, Tom was admitted to Talbot on January 12th of 1930. And I actually now had a physical description of him. Tom was a 39 year old white male, which was older than what the press had been reporting. He stood 5 feet 7 inches tall, which is 170 centimeters, weighed 180 pounds or 81.6 kilograms, had black hair and blue eyes. His crime was obviously burglary, and he was scheduled to be released on November 12th of 1931. Sounds like good news, huh? But unfortunately, that date was crossed out, and something was written to the right of it. And it took me a few moments to decipher that handwriting. It was a little messy. But it read, quote, Accidentally killed by truck, September 23rd, 1930, end quote. 
And now that I had a date for his death, a quick search of the newspaper articles of the day revealed why I couldn't find reporting on his death before. You see, instead of McGee, that's capital M-C, capital G-E-E, M-C-G-E-E, the articles had all misspelled his last name as McGee, as capital M-C, capital G-H-E-E. They added an H in there, and that's why I couldn't find them in my searches. Now, the stories explain that Tom had been seated on the back of a convict camp truck when it suddenly jerked, throwing Tom from his seat and then backing over him and breaking his neck. Tom was then buried in a potter's field. I'll leave you with one final quote, which was part of an Associated Press story describing Tom McGee's untimely death. A camp official stated, referring to the hogs, that, quote, they never thrive better than when Tom was looking after them. Useless? Useful? I'll leave that for you to decide. Okay, so what do you think, Mary Jane? Well, I do have to say that you kind of forewarned me that it was supposed it, that it had a kind of a sad ending. So I was expecting something actually even more horrendous. I, I was expecting more details. Um, I can assume, though, that he was doing hard labor. And uh, for how long was it from when the judge told him he was going to have like a new or a different kind of experience to when he actually died? About nine months, I think. Uh, basically, he went in in, in uh, mid January and uh, died in uh, you know late September or so. So about about uh, nine months. Right. Um, I've had this story sitting around for years. I mean. Uh, I mean, you know, I have piles and piles of folders and stories always going. And there's always some that I don't have the answers to. And this is one that, you know, would come to the top of the pile every six, eight months or whatever. And uh, I actually had, uh, when I first came across it, the original story was just basically this guy wanted to spend Christmas with his hog. So I wrote the word Christmas across the top because it's very hard to come across good Christmas stories, at least ones that people haven't heard before. Right. And uh, so I wrote Christmas on there and I only had the one sheet and then over time I added to it, but I never knew how it ended. And for years I've been searching for the ending. And when I came across this a few weeks ago, I'm like, I don't know if I can tell this story or not. It 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 is sad. I mean, it is very sad. Yeah. But you know, sometimes, you know, even though it's a sad story and it's not your typical uplifting Christmas story, uh, I I think it's a story that kind of will stay with you for a while, you know. Right, it, and, it, and you can't, I mean, you can't change facts. Mm-hmm. And the judge was concerned, what he was saying is that this was becoming uh, like a comedy almost, the way he was, you know, the, the person was acting. And, right. And it was a problem. Yeah, but, he, was, he was just committing these tiny little crimes mm. just so he can get back on the chain gang. And that, that's not really what the purpose of the system was. And, I mean, everybody knows how cruel the uh, chain gangs were back then. And the fact that he wanted to go back, it was pretty obvious he wasn't being treated the same way as everybody else. Right. He, like you said, he was getting preferential treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, I would almost say from the description, from the quotes that, that today he would be called special needs. He was certainly very childlike. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew he was harmless. And so he did get special treatment. And so, you know, it was around the, it was the depression, right? Yeah, it it started in 1928. So that's, uh, that's just prior to the depression. Right, 29, yeah. But, but, you know, uh, I was thinking that as I'm doing this, you know, by the second or third time that he got out and he's starting to commit these crimes, the Great Depression was kicking in. So the chance of someone like him ever getting a job uh, yes, was maybe and, very difficult. And maybe too back then people just didn't want to give a job to someone like that. Mm-hmm. He clearly enjoyed doing, you know, farm work, right? Right. Um, but unfortunately but, he lived in the city of Atlanta and, you know, uh, probably if he was out in the country somewhere, you know, away from the city, he may have been able to, you know, secure employment that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, he was homeless, right? It, he mm-hmm. just, he was somehow people found an interest in his story because it was, it was kind of funny in a way, although mm-hmm. it was d- definitely sad when you read into it. Yeah. It, it, it was one of those stories, you know, cause he, he'd be sent away for six months or 10 months at a time. And every time he'd be out for a week or two he, and he, and he gets, <laughs> and, and basically be thrown back on the chain gang. And again, he'd be in the national papers. Uh, right. Wow. Uh, but but yeah. oddly, when he passed away, you know, when he had that accident and uh, you know got killed, I only found that in a few newspapers. Somehow, uh, the other newspapers across the country uh, didn't pick up on that story. 
maybe because his end was so sad, they just decided not to publish that information, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, uh, it, 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 it's just kind of surprising that they had followed that story all along and, uh, and kind of dropped it at that point. But it's, it's a very, very sad ending. I, I have to say when I came across that a few, so I was just going through Ancestry, and I've looked before over and over again, uh, through Ancestry, My Heritage, uh, you know, all the newspaper archives, mm-hmm. unable to find out anything beyond that. He just kind of vaporized, disappeared. And then I came across that one line in the Registry of Convicts. And I, I honestly, it, it really just took me down a notch. I mean, it really, I didn't feel good at that point. Right. It was just such a sad ending to someone who didn't have any advantages in life, you know? No. And then you said he was buried in the Pottersville section. Uh, Potters. No, a uh, Potter's grave, which basically, uh, you know, unmarked grave. Uh, For the poor, right? Right. The section of the cemetery where the very poor go. Yeah. And no family claimed him or anything like that. So uh, just, just a, you know, awful ending. I, 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 I guess in my mind, I've been hoping for all his years of, and, you know, a more positive. Yeah, I hope that you know he would have gotten ending. out and maybe gotten work on a farm, something, or you know, just even had a family or well, something. Well, you know, you do have to wonder if he was in the paper, why didn't someone offer him a job? If he kept saying, which he did, there are all these quotes how much he loved working with the animals. It's mm-hmm. sad. Yeah. Anyway, so I guess we should just bring this to a close, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks okay. doing real Christmas stories. All right. Um, the only, the only exception is, as you know, I may be getting dental surgery and I may not be able to talk. In that case, it's not going to happen. But otherwise, I'm planning on doing uh, a, a retrocast of just Christmas stuff. Okay. So so just to remind everyone that my latest book, The Flipside History, is currently available, as are my two previous books. That's Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. All three books are collections of long-forgotten true stories, just like the ones you always hear on this podcast. Now, I didn't actually tell you this, but uh, I did get a message the other day from my publisher. That's Mango uh, Publishing down in Florida. Yes. And they have included my book, The Flipside History, in their Nerdy Dad Guide book list for, for Christmas. Oh. Yeah. So so if you're a nerdy dad out there and you, uh, you know, or if you have a nerdy dad or a nerdy mom or anybody you know who's nerdy, uh, the book makes a good gift for them. As always, if you want to contact me about anything or even Mary Jane, you can contact us at uh, steve at uselessinformation.org. That's steve at uselessinformation.org. Uh, you can also contact me through Facebook, and you can also use um, uh, my website. There's a link there, contact form to contact me. Be sure to subscribe to the Useless Information Podcast or your favorite podcast platform, and you'll have immediate access to new episodes when they're released. Uh, I always mention this. My Twitter feed is at uselessinfocast, and also be sure to like the show on Facebook. Anyway, as we said, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, at least if I don't have surgery, and uh, we'll do our little Christmas show then. Okay. Yeah, so thanks for listening, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.